Welcome to Alonzo Blue Update 2. Welcome back to Nerd Out, the show where we take a look at Cardano and we break it down, but we don't dumb it down. Uh, today we're talking about Alonzo Blue and everything that happened this week. So let's go ahead and jump into it. So this is update number two. So this week, we all the pool operators upgraded to a new version of the Alonzo Blue 2 tag. Um, we all had to do it together because if anybody minted a block with the old node uh, while smart contracts were in play, it would have broken the whole network. Anyway, that all went well. We all coordinated well to ensure everybody was updated before anybody inter um, interacted with smart contracts. And we all got to inter um, interact with a very simple, um, not very secure, pre-built contract. And what I found is smart contracts on the command line are difficult to interact with. Um, the good news is that we won't be doing this by the time we hit mainnet. This is just for, for testing purposes and just kind of for the, the pioneers doing this uh, initial Alonzo blue testnet stuff. So how do you inter interact with contracts on the command line? Um, this contract they gave us, it was called Untyped Always Succeeds uh, Transaction in Plutus. And this contract is very simple. It takes an input script value along with funds, and then it will lock those funds beneath that random number. And the only way to get the funds out of the contract is if you happen to know that random number. And so as you can see, this isn't terribly secure. It's just for fun. If somebody guessed the correct number they could they could then steal your funds uh, but this is what I did I generated a random number mine came out to be this uh, 2.3 whatever billion number and then the next thing you have to do is you have to um, build the contract address so you know where to send the funds to and that's where you give it the script file the testnet magic and it'll give you out an address and that's where the funds need to go and so then um, you also need to know a script data value. And so what this does is it takes this number and it runs like a, a hash on it. We'll, we'll get to that later. And so that's the, the value that is locked. It's locked under this value in the smart contract. And then I've gone ahead and built a transaction around that. And I've passed in my, my data hash that will lock it. And then I'm sending in 100 ADA into this contract. And then I'm returning the change to myself, um, paying the fee. Um, well, in fact, this is the, the first transaction. This is where I'm just building it with a dummy transaction, dummy, dummy fees, dummy invalid. Um, you notice a new Alonzo error tag here. And then I'm using this dummy transaction to calculate what the actual fee will be which is uh, the same, similar to what we see on uh, Mary today. Um, then I went ahead and queried the tip, figure out where our tip is so that I'd have a correct invalid hereafter. I'm now using the correct fee to build the real transaction. I sign it with my real funds key. Um, and then I just kind of dumped it here so you could see what it looks like signed. You notice it says transaction Alonzo era. That's something new. And then we submit the transaction just like normal on the command line. And then if you query the UTXO of this contract address, you now see we have this new um, script data in Alonzo era. And so that's the hash of all the script data we passed in. And if you look down here, you see there's a bunch of people that are interacting with this contract. And this last one out here is mine with the 100 ADA. And you'll see my transaction hash here as well, the EB50. And so now, what happens if we want to get the money back out? So we have to know what our UTXO was, which is our BFA. If we go back a screen, you see that here's our, our transaction hash. Whoops. The BFA 0888. And so that's the one I am trying to get out of the contract. And so that becomes my UTXO in. So the input of this new transaction is actually going to be 
the contract. The contract is, is on the input side. Um, that's the Plutus UTXON. I also have this other one that was pound one, which is my change address. The, uh, the fees on the testnet right now are super high, um, and that's so that our transactions will always succeed because we have really high execution time lumps, everything. That's all going to be straightened out before mainnet. But right now, you can see I'm, I'm paying a ridiculous transaction fee of 800 ADA. Um, that won't be that way come mainnet, but um, just for our testing purposes, it's a little high. And then we can go ahead and specify. Yeah, you also have to specify um, a couple of interesting things here. You have to specify um, the transaction in execution units. That's like how long the script is going to take to run. It's kind of an upper limit. You also have to provide this collateral. So if you screw something up, if you're messing with the network, um, that way you still have to pay something for messing, uh, messing up the contract. When we get to mainnet, you won't have to worry about any of that. You'll be interacting with websites and, and very simple stuff. If you're just a, a regular smart contract user, things will be made very simple for you. Um, this is just, again, the low-level low level stuff. And then we sign it like we did before, and we submit that transaction, and we get submitted. And then if we query that contract address again, you notice there is no 100 ADA line here. It's gone. It's been spent. And it's, again, back in my wallet. And so where are we at right now? Confidence right now is still in the green scale, not beyond confident, but still very confident that um, everything is looking good. I know Charles tweeted just the other day, we're looking to head maybe into white soon and head out of blue, which is great. Um, but yeah, things are, things are looking up right now. So a little bit of bonus content for you today. Um, I mentioned that these contracts are not, or this contract is not secure, and they did this intentionally for us so we could kind of play around with it and try and steal somebody else's funds. Um, so the first thing I had to do was figure out what this um, hash script data, script data value line does. So I, I tested it with a value of zero, and it gave me this hash value that starts with 0317. And so then I, I thought, okay, well, this looks like a Blake2B hash. And so I straight up just um, said, what if I do the Blake2B hash of zero? And what do you know? It worked. So all it's doing in this case, if the script data input is very simple, just like an integer, it's, um, it's going to just be the, the integer value. And so then I, I checked it and I said, okay, what if I do... My, my own one that I did before, the random number one, and see if I can get that to match. Now, when I put that in as just a number, um, it did not match. I had to actually Seabor encode it in order to get it to match. So this is actually what it's doing under the covers, is it's taking this number, it's encoding it to Seabor, and that is used as the input to the smart contract. And so if you go and you hash that, it will it will match and so the reason I'm doing this is I need to calculate um, like let's say I want to steal somebody's money so there's in this um, there's 2,000 ADA now that's a pretty juicy target and I know what their hash value is what I need to do is figure out what the number is the integer number that that will Seaborn code and then hash to this value and so that's why I had to figure out in code because I don't want to be calling this Cardano CLI command over and over and over. That'll take forever. I want to do it in my own code. Um, so what I've done here is I've taken this FE value, that's the, the target hash I'm looking for, and then I'm spinning up a ton of threads to go through all, um, all the hash values, just, just the highest byte. So I'm I'm looking, I'm assuming this is going to be a tricky one to find, so I'm assuming it's, it's a full... 8 eight byte integer, so like a an unsigned long, um, or it could be a negative unsigned long. Um, Seabor allows you to have a pretty big long value, so this may take a while. And then inside this calculate function, so I've spun up 32 threads. Um, inside each thread, I'm doing, I'm building the Seabor value. So I, I know already that a positive integer starts with 1b and then it encodes the 
the hex bytes of the integer, and a negative is a 3B. And so I'm not even running the Seaborn encoder, I'm just manually setting the bytes. And so I've got nine bytes to encode. The last eight are my integer. The first byte is whether it's that positive or negative. Um, and so then I'm building it up. I'm doing the Blake 2B hash. And then I'm checking to see whether it matches my target. And then we'll print it out and we'll say got them. Um, as of the time of the shooting, I um, it hasn't converged on an answer yet. There's a, a lot of key space and it may not converge. Um, you know, there's there's a whole lot of space in the keys, and if somebody picked a really good random integer for this one, um, I may I may not get it. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to show you kind of the technique I was using to go after it and potentially hack it like they had asked us to. So with that, nerd out.